morning to you, uh, La Paz de Sabbat, uh, good Sabbath, Shalom Aleichem, uh, may you be blessed today. Let's take a walk together uh, on this Sabbath, let's take a Sabbath walk together through the Parsha that is known in Torah as Beha Alotka, uh, in your arising, in your ascendancy, in your uh, rising up. And that's the message. We will be at a pivotal point this week as the script of Torah opens for us and we begin to walk in that script. We are at Parsha Behalotka, which is Numbers 8, 1 through 12, 16. Numbers 8, 1 through 12, 16 contains what I refer to as pre-departure protocols and uh, post-departure uh, attitude adjustments. Pre-departure protocols to prepare us for a journey. Post-departure attitude adjustments whenever we don't handle the conditions and environments very well. And so this is a pivotal uh, Parsha. We haven't had a Parsha of departure since uh, Yitro. Uh, Parsha Yitro, we departed from Rephidim and we came to Mount Sinai. Parsha Yitro was number 19 of the series. That was 17 parshas ago. We have since finished the book of Exodus, which uh, be, you'll be getting in chapter 19 of Exodus. We've gone all the way through the book of Leviticus, and we've gone through the first uh, two parshas of, of Numbers, and now we're about to have our next departure parsha. Uh, pre-departure protocols and post-departure attitude adjustments is our theme. I will tell you that the pre-departure protocols that we're going to be taught in the first part, the, the, before we get to the pivot point of Parsha Behalot, uh, are like uh, cures given in advance, uh, medicines, uh, uh, inoculations given from heaven against diseases that we will suffer, and he knows that are coming to us that will come upon us from earth. So cures given from heaven before we are attacked by diseases from the earth. Pre-departure protocols are like the cures given from heaven, and post-departure attitude adjustments are necessary because we are subject to diseases that arise from the earth. I need to kind of introduce this uh, study and, and take our as we walk our along together the the road of the Sabbath, and we try to in, in indulge uh, to receive to embrace the blessing the Baha of the Sabbath day, and as we try to uh, take into ourselves and be in, inspired by the uh, holiness, the Kedusha energy, that uh, the downflow from heaven into earth that comes with this day. As we walk in this and immerse ourselves in this Sabbath blessing and Kedusha or holiness infusion, we need to kind of get a, a picture of, of, of how the world uh, that we live in works. We are called to be a blessing to every family upon the face of the earth. That's the Abrahamic call. Uh, we are to to be a model nation. We are to be a goy kadosha, a nation of kadusha that uh, that oozes and flows in and emanates and 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 re radiates outward uh, the, the holiness infusion, the holiness of, of, of the holy one that we find in the heavenly realm and the beauty realm. Uh, so this is part of our calling, but we we are exposed on earth. We are here to, as missionaries, as it were, to this earth and to its nations and to its peoples. And we're not to sit to be here and judge them and criticize them. Uh, we are to understand them and to understand that what is in them is also in us. We merely have one advantage over them. We have give, be given pre-departure protocols. We have been given the cure before the disease. We have a uh, method. We have a wisdom. We have an understanding that will enable us to do uh, great and marvelous things, even in the midst of the trials and tribulations of this earth. So I want to introduce you to the current state of mankind by saying it this way. We deal with the fallen state of mankind uh, as dealing with a chain of fools and their folly. That is not to condemn them. That is just to understand that is where they are and that's all they know. 
this is the the worlds and the nations look at life the religions of the world the ethnicities of the world the political parties of the world the ideologies of the world the education systems the science systems the medicine systems all come about look they're a chain of fools immersed in folly and so we understand that uh, if you can understand that you can understand that our job is to bring a little enlightenment that will not blind them but will instead inspire them and encourage them to break the chain of fools to break the, the the grip of folly over their lives now this understanding is we're going to have to get to understand it in ourselves so that we can understand it in others if we understand it in ourselves and we can have empathy and sympathy for others we can approach them without judgmentalism or criticism but with compassion and with wisdom and with understanding which is what we need to do so the chain of fools is this that seed germinates and yields stalk stalk germinates and yields leaf leaf advances and produces uh, bud and fruit and fruit produces what the, the the folly that we're talking about so we're saying here that folly does not start full grown folly begins with a seed folly begins with a seed of anti uh, God anti uh, Torah anti uh, joy anti-shalom the seed of these things begins to germinate and then it begins to reproduce and stalk forms and then there's not just a negative seed at thought uh, which we're supposed to take every thought captive and we're to cast down vain imaginations but when we see a negative thought a negative thought is the seed of the chain of fools and uh, then we have from negative thought if we don't uh, cast it down like a vain imagination if we don't take it captive before it gets out of ourselves uh, it will result in a bad attitude our countenance will fall our our, our, face, our face will be be sour and uh, we will have uh, a bad facial expression we will not present ourselves well we will not present the joy and the shalom of the holy one well so negative thoughts will yield the seed of negative thoughts will yield the stalk of bad attitudes and a and demeanor that is unpleasant that is in that is entitled that shows we think we're entitled to something that we deserve something that someone owes us something that the holy one owes us something that life owes us something that's the bad attitude that is the stalk of the chain of fools after the seed of a negative thought so an entitled idea a narcissistic idea that the world revolves around us and that, that what we want and what we like and what we believe and what we uh, what aspire to and what we hunger for that these are the important things of life that's the bad attitude the entitled narcissistic attitude and that generates into a cynical attitude that nobody else gets it, that only our, since our interests are involved, no one else can really understand us. And therefore, they're all just a bunch of idiots, and, and we have to put up with them, and how, how cruel it is that we have to put up with these other people in the world. Negative thoughts, the seed, leads to bad attitudes, entitled, narcissistic, cynical approaches to life, which are the stalk. Oh, but we haven't got to the seed yet. Bad attitudes then begin to produce from them, the, from the stalk, toxic emotions. We become angry. We become jealous. We become temperamental. We become sensually based. We become sensitive to all sorts of things. We get offended easily. We get angered easily. We want to be vindictive. We want to be judgmental. Toxic emotions. We get jealous. We get envious. We get fearful. We get uh, proud. We, all sorts of toxic emotions. That's the leaf. That's whenever the leaf begins to take place. Ah, and then we see that it doesn't stop with the leaf, it goes to the fruit. Toxic emotions yield deprecating speech, speech that is t Lashon Hara, we call it in Hebrew, so it's speech of, of negativity. It's complaining, it's murmuring, it's, it's griping, it's uh, whining, it's, uh, it's accusation, it's, uh, uh, it's gossip, it's uh, tail-bearing, it's, uh, it's condemnation, it's, it's name-calling, it's label blame blasting it's uh it's falsity it's profanity it's lewd talk it's all sorts of de deprecating speech that's the f fruit that's the fruit level of the chain of fools and when you get to that you will not be far away from the ultimate uh the ultimate full-grown tree the full-grown Im uh, image 
which is debased behavior in all of its realms. We see perversion, corruption, uh, violence, uh, disruption, uh, rebelliousness, all sorts of irreverence, all sorts of things come out of this. This is the chain of fools. This is what the world knows. This is all they know. No wonder they're in such a state. No wonder the nations and the, and the ethnicities and the science uh, and the eth education systems and the government systems are so messed up. They live in the chain of fools and they have no other asset, no other way to deal with life. Who will break the chain? That's why we're here. We're here to live, to overcome the chain of fools and overcome its folly and to walk for, through it wisely. Now the last two weeks of our preparations here at Sinai and the pre-departure preparations have been about lifting heads, lifting our own heads, lifting the heads of those around us. If we do not have a lifted head, we will never overcome come the chain of fools. We will never see anything more than the negative thoughts project progressing into bad attitudes of narcissism and, and cynicism and selfishness giving in to, to negative speech to deprecatory speech to giving in to uh, bad demeanors bad giving in to uh, to behaviors that are toxic relationships that are corrupt like if we don't lift our heads you see the holy one's been trying to tell us when we face these things we will have no more to offer the world no more way to overcome the chain of fools than they do the nations that is so the last two weeks have been about teaching us about lifting our heads the importance of lift, keeping our heads uplifted above the things of the earth to focusing on the things of heaven of the beauty realm of the of the power the energy the caduceus that flows from the four living creatures and the 24 elders and the and the angels and the cherubim and the seraphim and from the very throne itself the river of life that flows from the throne uh the downloads of caduceus he he sends forth the waves of energy that he sends our way this is what we're supposed to be lifting our heads toward we're supposed to have an image in our mind of the tabernacle and it's a uh, beachhead, earthly beachhead, uh, the first fruits of the kingdom of heaven coming to earth in real time, in real space. We're supposed to have that in our heads, in our minds at all times, but we have to lift our heads above the ordinary, the mundane, the things, the profane, the things of this earth, the things of the, of the, uh, of the chain of fools. If we are going to be able to deal with the challenges of the arduous wilderness season that lies ahead, if we're going to be in the overcome the testing ground, pass the testing ground of this departure into the desert of Paran and beyond, if we're going to be able to do this as as a as a as a as a, as a, as a people, individuals and as a people, if we're going to do this and be the example to the world we're supposed to be by learn teaching them how to overcome the trials and tribulations of this world. If we're going to do that, then we have to keep our heads lifted. Once we keep our heads lifted, we get into this week's Parsha and the pre-departure protocols. It, as we keep our heads lifted, we, we have a protocol to rise up and kindle the lamps. Morning and evening, the, the priest was instructed, Aaron the high priest and his successors were instructed to get up every morning, the first thing in the morning. And then the last thing of the evening of the light, of the light is to feel, make sure the light is focused. And there's one main instruction in this pre-departure protocol we'll find in Parsha, the Halutka. Uh, and it is to make the lamps arise toward the forward, toward the presence of the Holy One. The focus is not to be on us, is not to be on ours or anyone else's ministry. The focus, the, the light is not supposed to shine upon p human beings. The light is supposed to shine upon the creative universe. The, the lamps of the tabernacle, the lamps of the menorah in the tabernacle were to be arranged, to be adjusted. From time to time they lose their adjustment as heat goes through them and the fire and the movement and all the things that happen in the camp. They, they come out of adjustment. So from every morning, every evening, first thing in the morning and the first thing as the light begins to fade away is to go back and make sure the focus, the direction of the light is on the Holy One. The, the priest was to make sure the lamps faced the, uh, the veil between the holy place and the most holy place. The veil before which was the presence of the Holy One resting upon the, all, all the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. 
Well, it's time for all of us to take this pre-departure uh, a protocol and apply it to our own lives. What is the first thing we do every morning? What is the first thing we do as we see the day fading and we move into the time of darkness and we lose that light? What? How do we handle keeping the focus not on what happened to us and how our lives have traveled, the traumas and the dramas and the issues and the challenges or even the successes and the glories that we have experienced. How do we keep things focused on the whole one? Do we have a protocol? Do we remember to do this? This is before we rid the disease. We get the cure. And the cure is make sure we have a protocol. We have a discipline in place to be able to keep the focus on the whole one. Otherwise, it will fall on us and all the chain of fools will come unraveling before our eyes. will wrap us up, tie us up, and drag us off. Uh, so we rise up, kindle the lamp, with which we are called to enlighten the world and carry it forth with humility and with honor. Are you ready? Look, every uh, discipline instruction that is given to B'nai Israel, and, and this is the the beginning of Parsha Behalotka, is the Disciplines of Discipleship series. We're going to learn some disciplines of discipleship. But remember this, every discipline instruction that the Holy One gave to B'nai Israel at Sinai contains the essential keys that they and we are going to need if we're going to navigate through uh, the temptations and the tests and the flesh triggering situations that he knows we will have to face. Why do we have to face them? Because if we're going to be a testimony to the nations, we have to have dealt with what the nations deal with. We can't live in some sort of an ivory tower. We can't live in some sort of a situation of a utopia where all is wonderful. We must have experienced what they experience, felt what they feel, hurt in the way they hurt, been disoriented and confused and, and in times broken the way they have been disoriented and confused and it's not times broken. If we're going to effectively model the goodness of the Holy One, and his shalom and his ability to overcome to the nations, we must go through these situations. He's not angry at us. This is not punishment. This is training. And every dis discipline instruction that it was given to us contains essential keys to navigate the next temptation, the next test, the next flesh-triggering situation the Holy One knows we must face. This week... The pivot point will be when the cloud moves and the great wilderness adventure from Sinai to Kadesh Barnea and beyond will be uh, on. Uh, the testing uh, that we need to have in order to be the disciples, to be the, t the model nation that actually has a testimony of overcoming, the testing we will need will begin in earnest this week. We will be launched far outside of our comfort zones uh, we will take up an arduous march toward our destiny. Uh, this will be the Parsha of arising to ascend. But warning to you, ascent, it sounds really good, but it is not easy and it's not linear. It doesn't happen uh, one step at a time. It happens two steps forward and three steps back sometimes. What goes up, you see, must come down. Every descent, however, that we make, every time we step or stumble or fall as we go through this process and this Behalotka experience, a pivotal uh, uh, walking with the Holy One. Every time it happens and we descend and we fall, this is only the predecessor, the, the, the pre prelude to the next great ascent, which is even higher than we've ever been before. So with that in mind, beloved, as we get ready to walk together, let's sing a song. Let's sing our call to worship the Baruch Hu, the blessing that we always sing before reading directly from the Torah. Join me in Hebrew if you would. Bakuet Adonai Hamborak Baruch Adonai Hamborak Leolam Vayet Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bachar Banu Mikol HaAmin Benatan la nu et torato Barukata arunai no tan atorah. Ah, oh, now may you open our eyes, O Holy One, that we may see wondrous things in your Torah. 
for we are but strangers in this earth. So do not hide your commandments from us. We always start by going back to the final words of the previous Parsha, the previous download, the previous week's revelation stream. That was Parsha Naso. And in number 7, chapter, verse 89, the verse ended, the, the Parsha of Naso ended this way. And when Moshe went into the tent of meeting, or the tabernacle of meeting, to speak with the Holy One, he heard et hachol, the, full, the ultimate superlative voice. <laughs> when Moshe went into the tabernacle of meeting to speak with the Holy One, he heard the ultimate and superlative voice, et hachol. He heard it speaking to him from above Hakaparet, the mercy seat that was on the Ark of the Testimony. There he spoke with him. He gave a word to him, the bar, a buzzing to him. And he did it from between the two cherubim. Now with eyes uplifted, this beginning of this picture of Moshe receiving revelation directly from the Holy One, from between the wings of the cherubim, from the above the Ark of the Covenant, from with, with the seat, the mercy seat, the hakaparet, uh, the voice, the ultimate uh, superlative voice speaking to us as Moshe, as it was for Moshe, may it be for us this week. Ah. Uh, but here's a warning. We are about to exit the beauty realm. That's beauty realm stuff when the voice of the Holy One speaks to us. We are about to exit the beauty, to descend into the earth again. And we must be ready for what happens when we get there. No pressure. <laughs> but all creation might just be watching to see if we're going to burn up on reentry or to see if we will actually hold on to our shalom and stick the landing this time. Here are the opening lines of our Parsha of the week, of our revelation stream that we're about to live in, of our script for this week's life, of Beha'alutka. In your arising, here it goes. It starts, and I'll read in Hebrew and follow with a little translation up down in English. Vayadaber Adonai Emoshe Lemor. And the Holy One spoke to Moshe, saying, Daber el Aaron ve'amarta elav, speak to Aaron. Say to him, Be'alutka et ha'nerut. In your arising, in your ascending to the lamps, to the lights, el mul p'neha menorah, the light that is, is always to be cast in front of the menorah to the front to the forward part of the menorah which means toward the face of the holy one you uri you iru shivat ha the shining the glow the, the the glistening of the seven lamps this is the message before we get too deep into what's going to happen when we leave sinai we understand we need to understand this is a cure for a disease we haven't got yet at Sinai, we didn't have to worry about losing focus or about having our, our adjustments, our alignment uh, challenged. Oh, but in the world, we will. The key is, do we have a discipline and a protocol morning and evening to make sure the adjustment of uh, uh, the alignment recurs and comes back into proper alignment? So... After the uh, beginning of, of the Elutka and the, or the alignment, the, uh, the adjustment that needs to take place, the preparation that we need to discipline so we don't lose our focus, because uh, that's the disease of, the, of the, the chain of fools, is that we lose our focus. We forget the Holy One. We forget the beauty of His voice. We forget the beauty of His throne above the Ark of the Covenant. We forget the things of the beauty realm and the Kedusha, and therefore we have to face and look around and focus on instead the profanity, the commonality, the mundaneness of this world with no other options, with no hope of overcoming it. Yes, that can take us down the chain of fools. It's going to go on. Uh, in the middle of the Parsha, it's going to say, it came to pass. This is the pivotal point of the Parsha. When we go from pre-departure protocols and preparations to then we'll go to post-departure <laughs> adjustments, attitude adjustments and corrections. But here's the pivotal point. Then it came to pass on the 20th day 
of the second month, in the second year after the Exodus, that is, that the cloud was taken up, the cloud of the pillar of fire and cloud that has been the evidence, the manifestation of the, of the manifest presence of the Holy One. It t- was lifted up from the tabernacle of the meeting in its ascending. Again, the Elotka is not just about lights. It is about seeing the Holy One moving and ascending and aligning with what he's doing. Well, in the second year, in the second month, on the 20th day of the month, the 20th of the Iyar, as it's called, we saw the cloud move. The cloud uh, then moved on. And um, on, and Ben Israel, the nation of Israel, set out behind it, followed the cloud. Mimid Bar Sinai on all their journeys, and then the cloud rested. It shakhan, it took up residence, it took up its rest in the Midbar Paran. So we're shifting wallpaper. We've actually got a departure narrative. We're going from Sinai to Paran. Paran is the place, of course, where Ishmael and Hagar settled after the, uh, the departure. They made their departure from the covenant household of Avram and Sarah. After the debacle on, on the weaning, the 13th birthday celebration, 13th celebration at least, 13th year celebration, of Yitzhak and the mocking and the violent attacking that Ishmael did, he could no longer live in that household. He could not safely live, be there and be trusted with Ishmael. So he was sent forth uh, with provision and sent out and he wound up staying in Paran. Well, the spirit of Ishmael is all over the desert of Paran. The ways of Ishmael became uh, ingrained in that area. So we're here generations later we're still dealing with the wild donkey of a man whose hand is against every other man, who is jealous, who is envious, who is under the influence of the chain of fools and caught up and immersed in their folly. Ah. And so when we start off, we'll start off uh, and by the hand, by the, by the voice of the Holy One but we'll uh, wind up going by the hand of Moshe. Now, the three, the, 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 the pre-departure uh, protocols, the disciplines that we're going to need to be cures, if we're going to be able to handle the diseases that will arise as we go out into the Paran Desert, these things are first the lamp lighting protocols. We've had a brief discussion about that. The idea is adjustment, alignment, and focus. If we don't have adjustment, alignment, and focus on the Holy One, if we don't have continual returning back to gaze into the heavenlies and the beauty realm, we will be caught up by the things that happen upon the earth and the negativity of them. So this is before we get the disease of being having to face things upon the earth that aren't pleasant and aren't likable. He gives us the idea so that you can always look up. You can always lift your head. You can always look into the heavenlies and draw energy, kedusha, and an inspiration from the king. Well, that's step one. Step two, the second thing is he, he's going to go through some instructions pre-departure about uh, the Leviim, the Levites, the other members of the tribe of Levi. Now, if you recall uh, Yahu, our, our ancestor, he called Israel. He had 12 sons. <laughs> and then one of those sons, Joseph, had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And so what we have is we have technically 13 tribes, If you because he adopted Manasseh and Ephraim, Yaakov did. And that made totally there were 13 sons after the adoption. One of those sons, one of the tribes, however, was specially chosen. And this is, a, whenever you see a special choosing, oh, you have earthly reaction to that. No one likes it when somebody else gets chosen. But the Leviim, the tribe of Levi, got chosen to her special accommodation. They were going to be different than the rest of the nations. Can we handle the fact that we also have been chosen by the Holy One, and the nations will not always approve of that. To the contrary, they will fight that. They will hate that. They will sometimes hate us because of that. The chosenness factor is a blessing, but it is also, in some regards, we will feel the pain and the stress of it uh, in this earth. In addition to that, the, what you find out is not just is are the Leviim to be special, or are we to be special and chosen and appointed for special purposes. We also must coordinate 
with and actually serve the other tribes. The Leviim were to be servants, servants to the priest and servants to the tribes and to the world. Now, this idea of becoming a special people who is a servant people, not someone to lord it over everyone else, not someone to to boss everybody else around and tell everybody what to do, but to serve them and to, to try to build a relationship, to be faithful servants that uh, try to, to, to build uh, and make the lives better of the world around us, be a blessing to all the people. This is the calling. So learning cooperation, uh, humility, protocols this is important because we're going to find out that the world does not know humility does not appreciate humility does not understand how that people are to cooperate as opposed to compete that that human beings are designed with the capacity to uh, overcome and forgive trespasses rather than punish and be offended and carry offenses and outrage and and uh, over offenses that we are to learn how to transcend and overcome sin scenarios as opposed to wallow in them and bear grudges and wounds and scars about them this is the idea of the the cure of learning uh, to watch the Leviim and watch the interaction between the Leviim and the priests. The priests were the highest of the of the Kedusha group, but they were to honor the Leviim. They were to lift them up, wave them, a wave offering, as it says in the in the in the English translation. But the idea is to lift them up, to, to uplift their their brethren, the Leviim. Can we do that? Can we prefer others to ourselves? This is the key, because you see, in the wilderness. Ha, in the Paran Desert and beyond, in America, in the Western world, in all the world and areas where you live. Ah, the, the nations do not do this. What the nations do is lift themselves up. They exalt themselves. They exalt their own ethnicity over others. They exalt their own uh, ideology over others. They, every Any way they can differentiate themselves from other people, they do that and they lift themselves up as a group and individually they lift themselves up even amongst their own groups. This is why there's such division. This is why there's such hatred. This is why there's such animosity. This is why there's such violence. This is why there's such perversion in the world. So we have given the the cure of learning how to appreciate each other and their special callings and to coordinate and cooperate with them as opposed to competing with them or being jealous, envious of them or being having malice, harboring malice toward them. Well, that's the key, second thing. The third pre-departure protocol is to put Passover in its proper place. The third thing the Holy One talks about before our departure, before the pivot point, is to make sure we celebrate the Passover and do it together. And even if we can't all do it together at the same time that we not forget to do it, but 30 days later at the 14th uh, of ER, uh, well, most people are doing it at 14 Nisan Aviv. That we're going to, if we can't do it for whatever reason, he says the Passover is so important that it is the only festival that you repeat if you can't do it the first time. 30 days later, one full moon, one cycle of the moon later, the next full moon, you begin to celebrate. You eat the the unleavened bread. You 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 dip it in the bitter herbs, and you tell the story of the redemption. This is so critical to who we are. Otherwise, we will forget we are redeemed. We will forget where we've come from. We'll only look around like the rest of the people in the chain of fools at what, how horrible things are around us. We will forget we, how much we've been redeemed from. We will get to be thankful. We will forget to tell the story, which is the testimony, which is the reason we're here, to be witnesses of his goodness, his peace on earth, goodwill toward men approach, and his redemptive power and plan. Well, the fourth pre-departure narrative then is to teach us about orienting our travels, our experience, all our decision-making around him. The way it's going to be manifested in his instructions is going to be to show us the, the cloud, the pillar of fire and the cloud as being the the cue or, or the signal for everything we do. We always, is the cloud moving or is the cloud sitting? Is the cloud stirring? What is the nature of, of what the cloud, what is the cloud doing? What is the manifestation of the Holy One doing? Oh, this is not just for Israel uh, in, in the days at Sinai. This is for all of us to learn, to always seek, to watch and observe what the Holy One 
and what his presence is doing, what his manifestations are doing, because this is our follow the leader orientation. We must follow the pillar of fire and cloud the way sheep follow their shepherd, because we depend upon him, not upon. We can't stray away. If we stray away from the herd, if we stray away from the flock, if we stray away from, from the pillar of fire and cloud, then we will be caught up in the thorns and the thistles. We will be caught up in the chain of fools and their folly. Follow the leader. Stay attuned. Stay observant of what the Holy One is doing. We may not see a pillar of fire and cloud. We will not probably see a pillar of fire and cloud until he shows it to us again some days in the, in the tribulation to come. But in the meantime, we, we can always peer into this unseen realm using Sabbath as our, as our binoculars, using the festivals of our binoculars, using the Torah as our, as our binoculars, look into the holy realm and see what the Holy One's doing and follow his lead. If he hasn't taught it, if he's not doing it, then we should not do it because we think it's fair or right or just. No social justice movements for us. Finally, the last pre-departure a protocol that he gives, the last cure that he gives before the disease hits us after we make the pivot point and move into the desert of Paran. The last one is the giving of the, of the silver trumpets, the communication code. We need to be able to, as a nation, respond. Know this joyful sound and respond to that sound. The trumpets were given, the two silver trumpets were given to make specific sounds at specific times to tell the community which was dispersed over a large area the sound of that trumpet was to, we were to turn our ear to it and train our mind to understand what its message if there were two long blasts by or one long long blast by all both trumpets then we knew it was time to communicate to gather together all of us men women and children before the tent of meeting and get a briefing from Moshe and get a download from the Holy One. If it was, if we listened carefully and only one of the trumpets was sounding, we couldn't hear that harmony taking place between the two trumpets, then we knew it was time for just our leaders, our princes, to go to them and meet. There were special sounds that were to be made when each tribe was to begin its march. There were special sounds to be made each time there was a, uh, a ola or a shalomim, a peace offering or a burnt offering presented at the tabernacle. We were supposed to know this was not just a matter of something hidden in secret. These were to be known all through the camp because of the blowing of the trumpets. We were to know when the uh, when we were to muster for war. We were to blow the trumpets at each at the beginning of each festival. We weren't supposed to have a, a lack of communication or disagreement. Just when the when the trumpets blew, we knew the festival was beginning or ending, as the case may be. Well, these are the things that the tabernacle, uh, that the pre-departure narrative tries to get us to. Now, if we understand that the lamp lighting protocols tell us we're going to lose focus in the weather, or we tempted to lose focus in the wilderness. If the commissioning of the Leviim uh, tells us that we're going to have trouble uh, with jealousy and envy and battles between the Leviim and the other tribes, and the chosenness factor will get under our skins uh, in the wilderness, then we, we will miss the point of why this is important. If we forget that Passover is the, the one thing that binds us all together, we all share the same story of redemption, then we will divide ourselves whenever times get tough and the heat comes is on and we, we get tired and weary and the flesh is acting up. We'll forget that we are one people serving one God. We'll think we're individual clans and tribes and, and we'll be narcissistic and selfish and, and we'll break down according to ethnicity and ideology and all sorts of things. Passover is to unify us. Remember it so we have one song and one story. That's the story of redemption and restoration. If we forget to, to the, the protocols of following the leader, of following the movement of the, of the pillar of the fire and the cloud, or whatever manifestation he's giving to us in our day, if we forget that, then we'll follow men, and we'll follow rhetoric, and we'll follow our own ideas of what's right and good and just and moral. We'll follow all these things in opposed to following the Holy One. And then if we are not tuned the communication code, to the communication protocols of the kingdom, where we all know what everything means and when everything begins, we'll all do our own thing. 
and we'll separate into camps and denominations and then we'll join the nations because we got nothing better than them oh you see what's coming and we're being prepared for what's coming well then the launch we've talked about it already the cloud moved on the 20th day of the second month in the second year after the exodus then we have the proto the the, the proving ground challenges uh, the last part the last couple chapters of Parsha Haluk uh, are saying now that you've left Sinai what did you think you were going to receive did you, this is your testing this is not the games this is just the practices and how are you going to handle the tough things in the practice times so we led off into the wilderness and three days in we begin to come apart we begin to feel these tests Maybe we didn't do our lamp lighting protocols evening and morning to make sure we were aligned and adjusted and focused upon the Holy One. Maybe we didn't keep the Levi'im and our responsibility to, to walk humbly as chosen people in mind and respond to the chosenness of others kindly and with, with, with cooperation and understanding. Maybe we didn't do that, so now we're looking at others saying, why does he get this and why does he get there? Why are they there? Why are they doing this? Why don't we get to do that? Why, yeah, why, why they get privileged and why do we have to deal with whatever we have to deal with? Oh, we'd be in a breakdown along those lines. Maybe that's what's happening. Well, let's kind of look at it. Uh, the first thing that happens is we complain. Complain, just a seed. I talk about the chain of fools that starts with a seed, and the seed usually comes up with some sort of a thought that is uh, a disappointment, a, a dissatisfaction, a discontent. Oh, this is where we need to nip it in the bud. If it goes further than this, it's going to turn into a bad attitude. It's going to turn into a mood. It's going to turn into a, a way of approaching, a way of looking, a lens through which we look at life. So we need to stop these negative thoughts, these vain imaginations, these critical uh, ideas, the selfish, self-righteous uh, indignation ideas. And if we don't, obviously things are going to happen. So in response to that, the, the post departure adjustment, attitude adjustment that was given whenever we first just, just started with the seed of complaining was the Holy One sent fire from heaven around the edges and the outskirts of the camp. No one appears to have been injured or hit. It was like, do you remember what happened with Nadav and Avahu? Remember what happened the last time fire fell from heaven? It was just a warning. It was just an ah. Uh, it's not wrath in the sense, it's off, it's warning. It's uh, a clear and present warning of a clear and present danger. Tabara, we know the place of burning, but it wasn't about it, we, us burning. It was about a warning being burned before our eyes. To go back to what? To protocol, to pre-departure protocol. Okay, so that was a claim. But we didn't respond to that well. To the contrary, we begin to gather amongst ourselves, to have little gatherings of our own choosing. As opposed to looking to the levy and looking to the priest, we begin to gather amongst ourselves and have meetings and little conversations. And they begin to, the negative thought, the seed of that negativity of complaint and discontent was spread through it. And now we begin to develop and talk, talk about craving, the things we don't have. We focus on what we don't have. Oh, we could have focused on what we do have. We could have focused on the Passover. We could have focused on redemption. We could have focused on the manna. We could have focused on the water from the rock. We could have focused from the deliverance at the Sea of Reeds. We could have focused on so many things the kingdom of heaven is, and the calling upon our lives. And this voice that spoke from heaven and gave us the, the, the Torah and, and the downloads of the Sabbath. And the, oh, we could have focused on so many wonderful things. But instead, when we got together after the seed sprouted, the seed of discontent sprouted, we found ourselves griping and, and craving and wanting what we didn't have. We wanted fish like we had in Egypt. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. Uh, we, we wanted leeks and onions and cucumbers and melons. Things that realistically, that's what we want. Like you see, whenever you start down this negative road, then the mood sets in, then the attitude sets in. And then the bad attitude begins to take over. And it's whatever you can think of. All of it is negative. And so here we have, and so what the Holy One did, he, he gave us, he quailed. He gave us meat. He gave us things that we were not prepared. And how did we handle it? They thank you, Holy One. Thank you, Moshe, for praying for us. Thank you. No, we crammed it in our faces until we threw up, until we got dysentery and 
had bad bad th- this is what happened to us uh this is how and this was the post uh post departure attitude adjustment whenever that happened and then the third thing that happened the next thing that happened was that Moshe <laughs> had a flesh out himself our if we uh, uh, we we tend to be uh, susceptible to getting gatherings and and griping and complaining and and then that and transfers itself into the our leaders our appointed leaders who are called to be special and Moshe he just he says why don't you just kill me if you have to make me lead these people oh you see how the negativity the seed is sprouting and that seed, the chain of fools, is on operation, even with Moshe. Well, I just, and, Mo, and the Holy One says, no, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you 70 elders that you will be responsible for and responsible to, accountable to. And uh, they're going to have gifts and callings like the, the, the prophesying that they're going to do. All sorts of things are going to happen here that are going to stir up trouble. You, you, you this is an attitude post. Uh, departure attitude adjustment as opposed to following the leader following the pillar of fire and cloud now i'm going to give you a bunch of men with a bunch of opinions <laughs> to follow uh how you like that that's going to be your uh, adjustment attitude adjustment process and then finally he takes us to Paran. we we find out that we're in Paran, the place of pride the place of arrogance, the place of narcissism, the place of self-righteousness, the place of presumption, the place of pits in which we can fall, uh, pitfalls where we can, can be trapped. That's what looks to be ahead of us. Well, he always gave us plenty of cure before he let us experience the test of the disease. We could say, oh, how horrible. And how badly these people behaved. Or we can say, this is given to us as instruction to teach us. So we'll repeat their mistakes. What they did was normative. What they did is not abnormal, subnormal. What we did, what they did was normal. We must do something supernormal, beyond normal, better than normal. We need a transformative infusion of redemption and restoration and joy and shalom and hope every day. We need to follow the pre-departure protocols. We need to incorporate those into our daily life because if we don't lift our heads and look up and receive that download from the beauty realm, if we don't receive the Kedusha infusions he has in more mind for us, then we will become like everybody else. We will take our place bound by the chain of fools, trapped in the folly of vain imagination, division, and hatred. First Corinthians ten five through thirteen, Shalva Tarsus will say, Now these things, and he's speaking of these exact things, Numbers chapters ten and following. Now these things have become examples for us. They're written for us as examples. For us as examples. They're not just history of the people of Israel. They are for us for examples. To the intent that we should not lust after evil. Raw. Uh, self will. As they also lusted. And that we not become idolaters. As were some of them. I talk about idolatry as if it's. I call it 50 ways to leave your lover. The idea of things that we focus on instead of the Holy One. That we draw, uh, we try to draw wisdom or instruction or some sort of good feelings from as opposed to the Holy One. Fifty ways to leave your lover. And there are all sorts of them. But as it is written, Shaul said, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Uh, that's what it said. Nor, Paul said, Shaul said, let us uh, make... Uh, adultery or make uh, fornication as some of them did and in one day 23,000 fell let us not indulge sexuality sensualities or hypersensitivity don't let's not redefine love as lust and sexual activity and desire let's not do that as some of them did and in one day 23,000 fell let us not nor let us tempt Mashiach Messiah as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents all the things we're going to see take place over the next few weeks in Paran, in the desert, let us not do these things, nor let us complain 
as some of them also complain. Let us not let discontent, the seed of discontent, spread like wildfire through our camp. Let it not be in us. Let us cast down the vain imaginations and take captive every thought and make sure we don't either uh, emanate it with our facial expressions and show our disdain or discontent with our facial expressions, nor uh, speak deprecatory words, nor engage in debased behaviors. Let us not destroy. Let us heal. Let us take in the healing power and release the healing power not take in the toxicity of the chain of fools. And he goes on, Shaul does, to say, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Ascent, descent. Understand that if you think you're not going to fall, if you think you're above it all, if you think you're better than all the others of the nations or of the people of Israel or whichever you think you're better than, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. But he will go on to say, no temptation has overtaken you, except such as is common to man. The things that we're facing in the wilderness are just things that are common to man. The reason they're written in the Torah is because they're common to man. And they will be experienced in every generation, in every household, in every family, by every individual. No temptation has overtaken you, except such as common to man, Shaul said. But God is faithful, beloved, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, able considering the pre-departure downloads, considering the Kedusha infusions, considering the Sabbath experiences and walks you've had, considering the redemption you've experienced. You are able, by virtue of those, to handle them. And with the temptations, with the tests that you are faced with, he will also make a way of escape, of transcendence, of overcoming that you may be able to carry it, be witnesses of it, bear it, as it says in English. Carry it forward as witnesses that God is good and his ways are perfect and his ways heal and redeem. Well, beloved, our time together on our little Sabbath walk is about over. I will be leaving here at this desk in a few moments and walking a few steps and we'll be in the the main hall of gatherings at Biblical Lifestyle Center. You may be going wherever you're going. But drink in, drink in the wisdom of the Sabbath. Drink in the wisdom of Parsha, the Ha'alutka. Heed the pre-departure uh, narratives, the disciplines that he's given us to be able to overcome. Take into yourself all the energy of the Holy One and realign and adjust your focus before you face any more of the world. Let this Sabbath be a time of, of, of empowerment to you. Ah. Uh, you will be able to be the witnesses. You are the light of the world. I want to just remind you of Isaiah 52, where it says how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who speak the good news of the, of the Holy One. Beautiful feet, because we have walked through fire, as it were, and not been burned. Because we have experienced the same things the rest of the nations have experienced. Have dealt with the trials and the temptations the nations face. And we have not let ourselves be caught up in the chain of fools. We have beautiful feet. Now if you have beautiful feet, what will happen? Ah, oh, you will arise and shine. For your light has come. And the glory of the Holy One rises upon you. Isaiah 50, 60. And Isaiah 60 says, And you will be radiant. And the nations will come to you. The Gentiles will come before you and they will you will be radiant and full of joy this is our mission to be a blessing to every family every household every ethnicity on the face of the earth let's don't get caught up in the chain of fools we came out of bondage let's don't go back into it well shabbat shalom time for me to leave you have a good week